face. Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining our webinar. We are uh, very excited to have you here. We hope you're all doing well. Oops, I moved the computer. There we go. Um, so uh, we're going to do a webinar here with our good friend, Sam Meacham. Uh, it's about cave diving and exploration in the Yuc uh, Yucatan Peninsula. So um, just a quick introduction to Sam, and then uh, we'll kind of give a little bit of background on how Sam and uh, Deirdre and I know each other. Uh, so S Sam's earned his master's degree in science and natural resources in 2012 from the University of New Hampshire. And, uh, and he's actually applying that knowledge as we speak, which is kind of cool because a lot of people get degrees like that and work at Starbucks. So good job. <laughs> yeah. uh, he uh, has uh, made a lot of accomplishments uh, in, in the time that we've known him. Um, he's uh, been inducted as a fellow in the Explorers Club in New York um, for 20 years. Uh, he's um, been uh, a fellow with a NASA space grant. Uh, he's uh, been an honoree of, as a best adventure of National Geographic Adventure magazine. Uh, appeared in documentary fi films for numerous places like CNN, International Discovery Channel, PBS, NHK. What's, what's that, Sam? I don't That's know what Japanese, that. Japanese television. Yeah, nice. Uh, National Geographic again, uh, BBC and BBC's Natural History Unit. Um, so Sam is also, for some of the people that know uh, um, our other local renowned cave diver, Bill Phillips, who unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago, um, Sam has uh, done a lot of things with, with Bill as well, and, and they both knew each other very well. And in fact, one of the things that they did together was they uh, were part of the team that discovered Oshbelha, which is the um, largest underwater cave system in the world. Is that accurate? Mm -hmm. Not, well, it, it kind of goes back and forth, but uh, yeah, Sakaktun, which is just to the north, is now taken over that place. But oh, okay. I mean, the reality is it's all one big case. It's all system. connected, yes. But anyway, yeah. that's still a pretty cool thing that you guys did and, and still cool. Mm. And you're still exploring it. Um, so yeah. uh, so um, Sam uh, and Deirdre and I have known each other for about 30 years. We actually all knew each other from Victoria. Sam is from uh, uh, Texas originally. And, uh, and so Sam was diving with us all the time and um, we were good friends. And then Sam decided to leave us and he went down to Yucatan. He became a diving instructor and then he got sucked into the cave diving scene. And this was way before email and all these things. And we would all of a sudden get like packages sent to us with magazines and photos of cave diving stuff. And um, big messages saying, you guys got to get down here. So uh, we did eventually meet Sam down in Mexico and, uh, and got a chance to see what he does personally, which was really cool. And then, uh, and then since we haven't really had a chance to see each other. So this is really cool for us to actually get a chance to reconnect this way too. Um, so anyhow, Thank so you, COVID. I'm going to pass this over to Sam, uh, but before I do, um, so we're just going to um, be here to moderate. And so um, if any issues come up, you can post that in the chat and then we can try to work in the background to, to uh, make sure that everything's working smoothly. And then, uh, and then certainly if you have any questions, post them in the Q&A section. And we're going to do all the questions at the end, but we'll give you a chance to ask your questions and, uh, and so forth and make sure that uh, you, know, you, you get all that stuff. Because you're going to find that whatever Sam's talking about here is very interesting because I've um, had the pleasure of hearing some of it already. And, and it's, it's really, really cool. So with that, I will pass it to Sam. And there you go, Sam. Well, thank you. Thank you, Greg. And he's been very kind. Um, but uh, it, it is a real pleasure to reconnect with Greg and Deirdre and Ocean Quest. And, and I still look very fondly back on the, I spent about a year in Victoria and I was working for a marine mammal expert there uh, doing research on, on killer whales, but also in the, the Gulf of St. Lawrence, we did a project up there with bigger whales. And uh, that's really where my dad, I was certified as a diver in, 19, in 1985 as an open water diver. And I did my advanced diver. Uh, I think Greg might've been, or Deirdre might've been my dive master uh, when I did that course uh, with Ken Anderson. I don't know whether he's in the crowd tonight, but I, I still, Ken was my instructor. 
And uh, just, I, I still, uh, wherever I go in the world, I always promote BC diving. I think it's still some of the most exceptional diving I've done. And I've been to a m number of different places on the planet to go diving. And just the richness of life that you guys have there. You're so fortunate to be in the middle of it all there. So um, uh, just very happy to reconnect and hopefully uh, at some point in time, I really want to take my family up to that area because I, I haven't been back for a long time and I'd really like to get back up there and I'd love to kind of, now that I know a little bit more about diving, uh, uh, get a little bit more involved in or just at least do some dives there. So um, what I'm going to talk to you guys tonight about is kind of an overview of uh, the last 26 years of work that we've done here and and kind of the lessons we've learned over the years and how we've applied different technologies and uh, both underwater at the surface to help us do our work. Um, and uh, I'm more than happy to stick around for as long as you guys want afterwards to answer your questions. And, and it's quite possible you might have some questions that I can transform into a whole nother presentation. I'm, I'm more than happy to come back and, and do more stuff and expand on things if, if it's of interest to you. Um, really what I'm most interested in is kind of the, the stoke of diving and, and getting people excited. I think all of us are here because of that common passion. So uh, Mexico, there we go. So just to kind of begin and explain what I represent and, and who I represent here, uh, I'm based in Playa del Carmen, Mexico, and I have a nonprofit here called SINDAC, the Centro Investigador del Sistema Acuífero de Quintana Roo. Uh, we're in the state of Quintana Roo, Mexico, which is one of the three states that are on the Yucatan Peninsula, and we're on along uh, the Caribbean coast. I'm sure many of you have been to Cozumel, Cancun, Playa del Carmen, the Riviera Maya, et cetera. Uh, it's an incredible diving destination because of the, the Mesoamerican Barrier Reef and of course the cenotes, which is what I'm most focused on. Um, SINDAC's uh, primary mission is to facilitate research, promote education, and support the conservation of the natural and cultural resources associated with the cenotes and underground rivers of Quintana Roo, Mexico. So um, you can see here below, we've got several, we're, we're trying to get up to speed with all of our social media. That's one of, I guess, the benefits of COVID-19 <laughs> is that we kind of had to do something. So we're, we're starting to, uh, to do a little bit more uh, of that. And uh, so probably the best of all of these to kind of get the full insight to what we're doing is our Instagram, because at the top we have links to everything that, you know, all the projects and stuff that we're involved in. So it's kind of the easiest portal into our world. Um, so, uh, let's see. So uh, I always like to start off with kind of a, a basic ge uh, geographic uh, lesson here. And from my point of view, there's there's two very important things to understand about uh, the Yucatan Peninsula. Uh, number one, uh, that it's comprised of limestone. Uh, it's an enormous platform uh, that stretches up into the Gulf of Mexico. And you can actually see, I hope you can see my mouse here, but I'm outlining uh, a, a, a part that's the platform comes all the way up here and during the last ice age all of this would have been habitable uh, terrain people would have and animals would have roamed across this and limestone of course is is uh, conducive to the formation of solution cave systems which this peninsula is absolutely riddled with and we're really focused here uh, in uh, the, the Caribbean side over here, you've got Cozumel, Cancun, uh, Playa del Carmen, Puerto Aventuras, Acumal, Tulum, the Siancan Biosphere Reserve, and as you go further south, you get down towards Belize. Uh, the second really important thing to, to recognize about this area is that this strip of beach from Cancun south, it's about mm, 120 kilometers worth of beach, uh, that represents approximately 10 to 12 percent of Mexico's gross domestic product. So uh, all of that, of course, comes from tourism, which there is none of right now because of the, the coronavirus. Um, 
but uh, it's a very popular tourist destination because of its location and the many incredible places that we have here that people can visit and cultures, the ancient Maya civilization, the modern Maya civilization, uh, to name two. And so with all this development, though, comes uh, a lot of impact onto the cave systems here. And that's what we're really focused on with SINDAC, my nonprofit, is raising awareness about what's really hidden from view here. And it really is just this most magical world to travel down into. Um, this is just a, a kind of, I love this, this screen here because if we start on the, the left side, the meteorite, and perhaps you know that the, the, the meteorite that crashed into planet Earth 65 million years ago and now has been proven to, to have caused the extinction of dinosaurs and given us mammals our, our chance to rise up in the world, um, it, it struck on what would today be the northwest corner of the Yucatan Peninsula, just near a little town called Chichilu, which is north of Merida. And it's just, you know, we think the coronavirus is, is catastrophic. This was just beyond catastrophic. It's a, it's a, a, a six kilometer long meteorite, they estimated, that weighed one trillion metric tons, traveling at 25 kilometers a second that slammed into the planet, causing just massive, massive disruptions with tsunamis, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, and it was just cataclysmic. Um, and what's important to realize is that that impact crater is now covered by an average of 1.2 uh, kilometers of limestone. So the, the, the meteor impacted and then uh, in the sub subsequent 65 million years, uh, the limestone platform formed on top of it. Uh, and that is the Yucatan Peninsula as we know it today. The, the, the peninsula at that time did not exist, really. It was more of a shallow inland sea. Um, so things literally got off to a bang here with that. And uh, we have evidences I'll sh share with you uh, of prehistoric life within the caves here. Uh, the, the caves that formed subsequently uh, were dry over successive uh, ice ages. And during the last ice age, uh, people and animals ventured into these caves, mostly in search of water, uh, it would seem, and for whatever reason got lost and died. And we come across the remains of elephants, saber-toothed cats, uh, giant ground sloths, humans, uh, and another, and just this enormous assortment of, uh, of place to see megafauna and, and human activity, um, which is really exciting. Uh, you don't really normally go diving and expect to find a saber toothed cat, but we do. <laughs> uh, and then next, we have the ancient Maya civilization, which left their footprint everywhere here. Uh, there's some incredible archaeological sites scattered throughout the, the, the region here. Uh, Tulum, Chichen Itza, Koba, to, just to name a couple. And many people think that the ancient Maya disappeared, which is, is far from true. The modern Maya uh, make up uh, a huge part of the population of this region. Uh, the Maya in general, uh, I think there's over 35 million Maya that live throughout Guatemala, Belize, uh, Mexico today, and they speak over 30 languages, not dialects, but languages. So a, a Yucatec Maya from where we are would have a very difficult time understanding a Maya from Guatemala, for example. So it's an extremely complex and, and uh, little understood uh, culture. And it's, it's exciting because uh, when we do go into the caves, uh, we also find artifacts from the ancient Maya civilization, which is really pretty stunning. And then from a, a, a kind of a, a natural history standpoint, uh, we have uh, just uh, an amazing variety of life here, starting with the Mesoamerican Barrier Reef, the second longest barrier reef in the world. Uh, we have the second photograph you can see in the fourth line here. Uh, that's a jaguar peeking out through uh, some mangrove roots in the Shankan Biosphere Reserve that a friend of mine took. Uh, we have five of the six large species of cat found in Mesoamerica here. We have 540 species of resident birds, 
uh, just on the Yucatan Peninsula with, I think there's 18 endemics. Uh, and we have approximately 2 billion migratory birds that use the peninsula as a, as a corridor as they migrate north and south each year. Uh, 182 reptiles and amphibians uh, and 1,500 vascular plants. I've got an orchid there. I'm a big orchid fan. In fact, I've got some orchids blooming in my garden just behind my computer here. Uh, we have about 128 species and variety of orchid here on the peninsula. And so the last photograph is kind of the cave diver looking back through all of this. And, and that is, I kind of, as a child, always dreamt of having a time machine. And uh, this is about as close as I think I will ever come to being, have the, you know, the capability to travel back in time, not only human history, uh, but geologic and earth history as well. So it's just this, I, I, I moved here in 1994. Uh, as Greg said, to become a, a PADI instructor, and, and I did that, and then I literally fell into the cenotes, and I, I haven't come out yet. Uh, it's just, it's, it's the most amazing uh, place to explore, and uh, it's not just exploration with, you know, the planting a flag and then going home. There's, like, serious scientific knowledge that we are helping to uh, take out of these caves and understand better about the peopling of the Americas and one of the greatest ancient civilizations to have graced the, the face of planet Earth. So, um, as it stands right now, and this number, I have to change it every single time I give a, a presentation, but uh, as of June 2020, there are 386 underwater caves and cave systems. There's 1,534 kilometers of confirmed underwater cave passageway, and there's probably actually more than that. Uh, and then there's 354 kilometers of tri cave passageway. What's interesting about this number is that the top one uh, never really goes up too much. These uh, bottom two go up all the time, uh, but what happens is, is caves connect, and so what was two caves becomes one cave, right? So the, 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 the number of underwater caves, as I mentioned jokingly at the beginning, it's all one cave. It is this, everything is connected at some level here, whether a human can uh, squeeze through the space or not. That's kind of how we are putting our own system on top of it all. Uh, so there's a tremendous amount of stuff. Cave exploration in this area really started in earnest, I would say, in the 1980s, mid-1980s. And people came down, started exploring, and then uh, I'd love to be able to chart the kind of progression of cave diving exploration here. But it's just, it's ongoing and seemingly endless, as I'll discuss a little bit later. <clears throat> so what I wanted to talk to you all about uh, at the outset here is, is Number one, how we find cenotes, and I'll explain what a cenote is if you don't know, and then how we explore and map caves. So we're going to start with finding cenotes, and uh, Greg mentioned Sistema Ospelha, and this is cenote esmeralda. Cenote is actually a derivation of the Mayan word cenote, which means sacred well. So these are these superficial water uh, holes in the uh, middle of the jungle here. We think there's maybe eight to 10,000 of them all together across the expanse of the peninsula, <coughs> maybe more than that. Um, and this is Cenote Esmeralda. And, and Greg mentioned that I did a lot of work with Bill Phillips in the, the late 1990s and early 2000s. And this is uh, where it all began for Bill and myself. Uh, we hiked out to this cenote and looked over the edge and we're having a picnic right here where my mouse is and a knife fell out of my pocket into the water. And uh, we had put our, we just had breath felt of, uh, but what this became was kind of the, the centerpiece of our first project in Oshbelha in the Oshbelha cave system. And then it was just this ever never ending uh, kind of game of leapfrog throughout the jungle from one cenote to another to expand and continue the exploration. So cenotes are, they come in all shapes and sizes. It's hard to generalize. Just to give you some scale here, from one side of Esmeralda to the other is about 120 meters across. So it's, it's, it's longer than an Olympic swimming pool. No, uh, I think swimming pool is 50 meters. Anyway, uh, it's 110 meters. It's big. Uh, some cenotes are minuscule, 
and you know we can barely squeeze into one person into them. So um, it's hard to generalize about them, but generally they are pretty beautiful in a very stark and, and foreboding uh, forest that we have here full of thorns and cactus and uh, uh, poisonous snakes and all sorts of wonderful things. So that, that's actually a photograph of Bill from the late 1990s. And uh, it's funny, when we, when we all moved down here, we, you know, there wasn't Google Earth, there wasn't the internet. We, we just kind of had to wing it and figure out how to do things on our own. And so this is a favorite pastime of Bill's and mine. We worked at Aquatech via Starosa, and we would just kind of park the car and then with a lot of <coughs> naivete, and um, hope, we would just hike out in the jungle, hoping we would find a cenote. And uh, that didn't work so well. Uh, and so we, we kind of had to refine how we were doing things. It was just a complete hit or miss, right? Um, so what we've developed over the years are different techniques to help us find cenotes and to kind of have the best information we can get, of course, in the 25 years that I've been here, there's been such an incredible transformation of information technology that we have. Uh, I still can spend hours pouring over Google Earth uh, and just looking for some updates out there. So uh, we, we started with uh, a lot of optimism and hope and quickly that was dashed. Um, and so GPS technology also started coming online. And on the left side here, this is kind of how we started out. And we had available information in the form of topographical maps, aerial photographs, and we could combine these two together to get as much information as we possibly could about the area that we were going into. So we could use the grid system off the topo map and the, the much more detailed features off an aerial photograph uh, to navigate our way around and find things. And so we plug these hypothetical coordinates into a, a, a pretty low grade GPS by today's standard and hike off with a compass uh, and a mask and a light. And we were pretty successful at finding a number of different things, but it was, you know, there was a lot to carry around here. And in the back of my head, I was always thinking, well, wouldn't be nice if we could combine all of this stuff into one unit and in 2005 on the right side here uh, we were able to acquire uh, some Trimble uh, uh, GPS units the the Nomad and the Recon that allow us to upload uh, it's a touch screen and you can upload any map that you want into it and it's georeferenced so you can see exactly where you are in relationship to what you're looking for which is extremely helpful so the dream was realized by taking all of this and putting it into one unit and this is of course much more accurate and today we have iphones i mean it only keeps getting better and better so in order to actually locate the cenotes you know combining information with technology was very helpful and then as Greg mentioned, I, I went to the University of New Hampshire uh, for a graduate degree. I was given the opportunity to go back to school uh, from 2009 to 2012. So my family and I we moved back to the United States and I got a degree in natural resources with a focus on geospatial science and in particular remote sensing of the environment. And remote sensing and its, its kind of basic definition is the study of something without coming into contact with it. And our eyes are remote sensing devices, our ears are remote sensing devices. Um, so we can see and we can interpret. So, um, you know, there's lots of telescopes looking off into space, but there's also telescopes looking back at us. And those are satellites that, that like the Landsat 5 thematic mapper that I have as an example here, uh, that look back down on us. And Landsat 5, of course, it, it's a product of the Cold War and was developed to, to measure Soviet crop health. And, and then, of course, scientists started working with it and they started to be able to find oil deposits and mineral deposits and all sorts of different things. And so uh, when I went to UNH, I did my thesis was on the use of the, the Landsat 5 thematic mapper to identify and map mangrove uh, throughout 
this area right here, which is the municipality of Tulum, just to the south of, of uh, where I am right now in Playa del Carmen. And uh, the, the real power of this type of data is uh, not necessarily the spatial resolution. It's very, very coarse. And when we talk about spatial resolution, what we're talking about here is how big a pixel is on this image. So here, each pixel is 30 meters on the side. So it's very, very coarse. It's great for kind of sweeping landscapes, uh, but for minute detail, it's not very good. So the real power comes from the spectral resolution. And there's seven bands. There's three uh, visible, uh, one thermal infrared, and then three near infrareds. And it's really the three visible and the three near infrareds that you can play with in, in computer software. Uh, and you can start to kind of tease out different features uh, from Earth's surface. Um, the other really cool thing about this is the temporal resolution is that this was uh, launched in 1984, decommissioned in 2012. And so in that time, every 16 days, it would pass over the exact same spot and take an image and beam it back down to the, the planet, to the uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And uh, so you can monitor change. Uh, of course, there are some times when it passes over, it's dark or it's completely covered in cloud, but we have a few just absolutely beautiful cloud-free images of this region from the early 19, uh, 1980s uh, that show it in, in a pretty you know, pristine state, uh, which is very useful to us. So how does all this work? Well, I can show you here by matter of comparison, but the, the, these are all four images of the exact same spot, just seen differently. So we're going to start on the upper left side here, and this is an aerial photograph. And I can tell you because I know that this right here where my mouse is is a cenote. This is a cenote here. I know that because I've been to them. And so I could kind of reasonably guess that all these other things that look like them should also be cenotes as well. Uh, but as I've come to learn hiking in the jungle here, uh, that's not necessarily true. So if we move over to the right in this image, uh, this is the land side image right now. You can see it's a little bit more grainy. Uh, that's because of the coarseness of the 30 pixel. You can actually see the individual pixels here. And this is true color. This is as close to what we would see uh, with the naked eye. And when we come down to the bottom left, now we're in a false color composite here, which is starting, we're starting to use the near infrared bands. And this is the false color composite. It's, it's bands four, three, and two. And what it basically is showing you is the uh, health of the vegetation of the forest uh, out there in, in this particular area. And dark red actually is good. It means it's very healthy. Um, and then finally here, again, this is the exact same image. Uh, what we've done here, and this is where, you know, scientists have kind of staked their entire careers on figuring things like this out. Uh, this is something called the, the 5 over 4 ratio, which is uh, measuring moisture content in vegetation. So when I heard about that, I thought to myself, aha. Okay, well, cenotes are sources of water, and there's vegetation near cenotes always, and that vegetation is always much healthier uh, than the surrounding forest vegetation because it has year-round access to water. So could we potentially see cenotes uh, using this filter? And as you can see here, there are these, you can't see in any of these other images here, a green spot here, a green one here, these spots right here, uh, that means that there's high moisture content in this vegetation. And it's where there's these kind of big, nice light green spots like these ones here that I'm most interested in. So what we do is we mark them. So now I've got points on top of all the potential targets that uh, we could go and check. And what I've also done here is I've superimposed the cave system on top of it using geographic information software, GIS. So uh, really, this is exactly where we would want to find an unknown cenote, is right in the middle of where we have no cave exploration at all. 
and the cave exploration were just this is a representation of a, the, the guideline that we put into the cave. It's a measurement of the line. Uh, it doesn't really show the volumetric measurement of the cave. So we identified targets here. These were the three principal targets. They were in a perfect area for us. And then out here we hiked. This is the hike that we did. And we visited all three of them. And it turned out this one in the middle, the smallest one, uh, was this cenote right here that you can see in the bottom left, which we called cenote Cooper after a, a diving colleague of ours who, who had passed away. Beautiful, I mean, it's not a super picturesque cenote, uh, but this incredible tree right in the middle of it that grows out uh, very kind of like, you expect Yoda to kind of come out and start schooling you on Je Jedi stuff. Um, but you can see divers going into the water here, and as a result, you can see kind of the before here in the upper left and the after in the bottom right. Uh, we were able to connect that whole part into the cave system here. And it's, you know, it's a small victory, but it's still kind of cool to, to think that something that's 700 kilometers above us uh, taking this image uh, can point us with such precision to find a simulte. So it's pretty cool when, when things work, right? So that's uh, one type of, of technology that we can use, the satellite imagery. Another type of, of data that we, we have access to here for only certain sections of the state uh, is LIDAR, light detection and ranging, which uh, there was a big splash with it over the last year, year and a half, uh, a study done in Guatemala where they flew over the jungle and basically it's an airborne sensor that goes in the belly of an, a helicopter and a, a light aircraft and it flies over the jungle or the landscape and, and has uh, laser beams that are just going down uh, creating millions and millions and millions of points and literally it, this technology is able to strip away the vegetation so you see what's called a bare earth model. Um, and so in the bottom here, this is raw data uh, for the landscape here. Uh, and basically uh, all of these dark uh, spotches here are depressions out in the jungle. So it's just absolutely incredible. And it's much, much uh, better spatial resolution. So we can take that raw data and we can transform it into contour files, as you see here. And you can see we've got this one marked as a possible cenote here. And you see the steep grade. If you know uh, about topo maps, you know, that's telling us that there's a, a depression coming down here. So LIDAR is another technology we're, we're pretty excited about. Uh, it's pretty expensive and we have to rely on the government to fly over or private enterprise to do it. Um, but um, we do have drones now too. <laughs> And we bought our first drones uh, in 2017. We now have two of the Mavic Pro, as you see here, uh, drones made by DJI. And uh, if you've been to the peninsula before and you've flown into either Cozumel or Cancun and you come into land, uh, you immediately recognize just how absolutely flat, like a billiard table, uh, the peninsula is. There's there's very little vertical relief on it. Uh, there's the Cook region down south uh, where there actually are a few hills, but in general it's just flat as a, a pool table. So even if you call up to the tallest tree in the forest, you're still only that much higher than all the other trees. So uh, it's very, very hard to get any kind of perspective above the landscape until the advent of drones. So we, we first got our drone here to, to help us kind of use it as a periscope to get above everything and just fly around and see what we could see. And, and um, this is a very popular uh, cenote right here for tourism. Uh, I'm sure if any of you guys have been here diving before, you've done a cenote dive here uh, in El Jardín de la Den, uh, which is near Bar uh, uh, Puerto Aventuras, the Ponderosa cave system here. Uh, it's an absolutely gorgeous cavern dive. And this is a cenote we just found by flying around, just sitting out there in the jungle. It's also a super cool public relations tool as well. This is uh, one of the family's uh, farms that we, we dive in a cenote right here. 
uh, but we can give the landowners who have lived here for generations sometimes uh, a perspective they've never had before either. So that's pretty cool stuff. So the drone has transformed us and, and a, kind of at the beginning, it was just kind of a cool gadget and started to look around and realized that there were companies out there doing all kinds of cool things with, with drones. So we, we connected with a company called Drone Deploy uh, in San Francisco just last year. And Drone Deploy allows us to create a flight mission and we're one of their nonprofit partners. And so we have an enterprise uh, license at no cost to us, which is absolutely fantastic. And I can create this flight pattern here. Uh, the green lines are the flight lines that the, the drone is gonna fly. I can determine how high the drone is gonna fly. And then I just come out here and park my truck in the middle of this road. And I, I've gotten good enough that I can just open the sunroof on my truck, put the drone out and uh, it launch it from the, the top of my truck. So I barely have to get out into the sweltering heat. Um, but it's amazing because the flight plan is uploaded automatically into the drone. The drone takes off. It, I'm kind of monitoring it on an iPad in my truck. And then it just goes back and forth and back and forth. And it takes uh, uh, photographs at predetermined points. And we come back and we download all that information uh, into a computer. And we upload it to the server for drone deploy. And then fairly quickly, uh, they've got just all kinds of computing power. They're able to turn around here uh, a high resolution image of the area of interest that we have. So generally we're flying at about 300 meters of altitude. And with 300 meters of altitude, we get a, about a, a little bit less than 10 centimeter uh, pixel uh, resolution, which is high quality. If we want better, you know, if there's a specific smaller area we really want high detail on, we can go sub-centimeter uh, resolution on it. So it's just amazing. So this is really, kind of, I, I didn't really think about this when we got drones, but it's really transforming the way we do things. Another thing it does here is it creates uh, a digital elevation model. You have to realize this is all at treetop level here, but the, the redder parts are gonna be higher elevation, the bluer parts are gonna be lower elevation. And as you can see here, it's easier to see in this image on the upper right, uh, but this is a chain of cenotes called uh, Yashchen, part of the Yoshiko Hot Cave system here, uh, coming out through here, an incredible dive. And then this is a very rudimentary uh, uh, calculation of uh, plant vegetation health. And you can see a, a new road was put in here, and the health of the vegetation on this side is good, and the health on the, veg of the vegetation on this side is it's mangrove, in fact, and it's blocking flow of water, so it's impacting the, the health of the mangrove, uh, especially in the dry season here when this, this, this image was taken. So this kind of technology is really um, just, I, I, I could never have dreamt of it, and it's just, it, it's still uh, blows my mind that we can, you know, go sit out and spend I, I, I did a test last year to see with both drones how much I could cover in one day, and I did about 1,500 hectares in, in one day of flying. And then just, you're kind of cycling through batteries and recharging batteries, and sooner or later, one thing is gonna just give out and you have to give up. But uh, we can cover a lot of territory uh, pretty quickly. It really has a lot to do with how high you fly. Uh, another method that we have for finding cenotes is from underwater. And this is a cenote we had already uh, had line going to, but we didn't have a proper GPS coordinate for it. So I basically just stuffed this small Garmin GPS into a light canister and strap it on my side. And then when we get to the cenote, I get out of my gear, I get the light canister out, I pull out the, the GPS and we can get a fix, a pretty good fix. That's Mark Garland there, who's uh, from Ontario. A lot of Canadians here, good to, a lot of Canadians. I didn't do that on purpose. <laughs> but uh, Mark's a solid guy, and it's just a super fun dive. And you, you, know, you pop out in the Sanofi in the middle of nowhere, and uh, all the birds and fish and whatever else around is, is trying to figure out what in the world we are. Uh, so that's another way we can find Sanofis as well.
Um, and this is just, you know, to show you that this was two weekends ago. And at the end, I, I saved this for the end, but really the, the most critical factor in finding cenotes for us, of course, is the human factor. And it's the people we know and the relationships we've developed. And you've taken a cave diving class uh, from any agency. One of the first things you learn that you can't dive on land that you don't have permission to dive on. And so over the years, we've developed numerous relationships with individuals and communities and farmers and just all kinds of people. And just out of the blue, like three and a half weeks ago, my friend Javier in the bottom left here, uh, who I worked with 20 years ago out in the jungle here, called me and he's like, man, I've got this cenote that my friend found and would you guys be interested? And of course, <laughs> you don't have to say much more than that to us. And so we were out there two weekends ago and we just did a reconnaissance dive, but it just as you can see, this absolutely gorgeous cenote and we had to rappel down into it and then be hoisted back up. And we have plans uh, to go back and go diving in it uh, one of these days. It's, it's, uh, we still haven't been diving in it. And today, for example, I just got images sent to me of three cenotes today uh, that a, a friend of mine wants us to go diving. So as I mentioned, it's just, it's endless. It just keeps on giving and giving and giving. Um, so that's kind of finding some of these. We've got incredible technology, we've got incredible data sources, um, and we have, uh, of course, the human factor as well, which I would consider the most important one. In fact, one of the, the main things that we're dealing with right now as a result of the, the pandemic is that there is no tourism here right now, and, and everybody here uh, depends on the tourism. Uh, industry. And so the most heavily impacted of all of those are the Maya communities that we've worked with for, for many years that depend on ecotourism to come out to, to see their cenotes. And so we've started a campaign and just today we delivered food to 180 families in two communities that we've had long-standing relationships with and just trying to give back to the people that have always been willing to give to us. And so it feels very good and, and you know, in such a horrible time for all of us uh, to try to do something uh, meaningful. So uh, that's how we find some of these. And so the next step is exploring and mapping them. And so it, it's a bit of a process and uh, it involves, of course, gear and all kinds of different gear configurations and uh, a considerable amount of, of logistical support and help and planning. It's uh, on a basic dive, we can have, I don't know, 60, 70 kilos of equipment each. And sometimes we have to go a kilometer, kilometer and a half to get to the cenote. So physical fitness is, is also a good thing. Uh, as well, uh, because a lot of times we carry our own gear, we can hire people to carry gear. We have had horses in the past, four wheel vehicles, four wheel drive vehicles, helicopters, etc. But uh, usually it's human power that gets us there. So the first step in, in when we initially see a single day, as we did in the one that we just visited a couple of weeks ago, is we free dive it. And so free diving is absolutely a skill that we are all very uh, keen on. And uh, before we start lugging out all of our equipment into the middle of the jungle, uh, we want to make sure that it's worth going through all the trouble to get it out there, right? So this is Fred DeVos, and Fred's from uh, Stratford, Ontario, and one of the people I've been diving with for uh, well over 20 years now. And in this picture, this is Christophe Le Maillot, who's from Brittany in France. And Christophe and Fred and myself uh, are kind of the core group of divers for Sindac. And we've been diving with each other for years and with Bill at the outset for, for the exploration of Roche Belle Ha. Um, so what Fred is doing here is, is I'm staying at the surface, he's diving down, and we kind of take turns and assessing and looking. Uh, and as beautiful as this cenote looked, it, it actually didn't pan out uh, as we had hoped. There was kind of a tunnel going off that we thought would open up, but it didn't. Um, 
So then once we've assessed the Sonote, we kind of have to figure out, well, what kind of equipment configuration do we want to use? And we have uh, a variety of different configurations. Our, our kind of go-to would be back-mounted uh, twin 80 cubic foot cylinders. Um, we have side mount gear that we use. We usually use steel 85 cubic foot tanks uh, for side mount. Uh, nice uh, amount of gas that that gives us. Um, and then let's see, down here we've got, uh, this is an RB80 rebreather. This is kind of the real workhorse of what we're doing. Uh, just over the last, uh, the previous week, uh, we spent, we did, uh, three three days of diving and with an average of six hours of bottom time on each dive and using the rb80 it's a semi-closed circuit rebreather system uh, developed in europe and then taken over by halcyon manufacturing and it's just a simple semi-closed circuit rebreather it's got an eight or ten to one ratio uh, that allows us to we always have lots of bailout between us and the exit uh, depending on how far back we go, uh, but it just gives us an incredible amount of time to really scour the cave and, and do as good a job as we, we, we can. Um, under development right now, this is a, a side-mounted version of the RB80, and uh, hopefully in the next couple of weeks, I'm going to be taking uh, delivery of the latest prototype of this. Uh, this is what Christoph has been working on tirelessly here. Uh, but it's it's uh, it's definitely gives us the ability to get into slightly tighter places, which is is good in some circumstances. Um, and I'd have to say, and I'm pretty sure Greg, you would agree with me here that that there there's been lots of advances in diving, but some things have just kind of st stayed static. You know, regulator is a regulator, and it's you know there's different designs and colors and things and they they all work i don't think you can buy a bad regulator now um but what's really transformed what we do here is light technology and battery technology so you know we all use these we take two each of these handheld lights now and i'm doing six hour dives with these one of these halcyon lights here and it lasts you know the entire six six and a half hours that i'm underwater um, and that's due to the fact that it's using an LED bulb and lithium ion battery. Uh, the scooters we use, we use the Suex XK1s and the X-Joys uh, and the, you know, lithium ion batteries. The dives that we were doing last week, just to give you an idea, we are an hour on the trigger to get back to where we start doing the dive. And we can do an hour in, an hour out, plus a little bit of kind of snooping around uh, and we still have about 30% of our battery left when we come back if we're you know not going into too much of a headwind um, and we're nice and streamlined so the batteries you know it, it depends on how fast you're going to uh, but the, the batteries and we'll kind of look back at where we started with lead acid batteries and halogen lights and uh, lead acid batteries on scooters. Uh, they were heavy. These things are all just super light, super durable, and very well produced. So that, I, I, you know, I can't wait to see what else uh, comes out of it. Um, and I didn't mention here on the bottom right, this is a, a KISS Classic rebreather. It's a closed circuit system uh, that I've been trained on as part of the Oyo Negro project, which is a paleontological project here. I'd love, Greg, for my friend Beto Nava uh, uh, potentially to give you guys a presentation about Pueyo Negro. It's, it's an incredible site. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a, in a nutshell, it's a, it's a, it's, I don't know whether you're familiar with the La Brea tar, uh, tar pits in, in Los Angeles where all sorts of animals fell into these tar pits and were just basically frozen in time. Uh, Oyo Negro is, is there's a, a huge, hole in the middle of the cave that goes down to a maximum depth of about 60 meters, an average depth of about 40, 50. And at the bottom, all these prehistoric animals and one human, a young woman, uh, fell into it. And it's a very sensitive site. And at that depth, when our bubbles start rising up to the ceiling, 
they can dislodge sediment in the worst case, you know, rocks or stalagmites, spheliotems from the ceiling that can crash down and impact this very, very significant uh, paleontological site. So we took to using the, the CCR uh, to avoid bubble impact, really. Uh, but also it helps us tremendously, obviously, with decompression and everything's kind of on board and we have bailout gas at all the requisite depths. Um, but it's proved to be a pretty reliable uh, system for us, which is it works very, very well. So uh, right tool for the right job. Right. And so we have a variety. We have side mount, back mount, side mount, semi closed circuit rebreather, side mount. Or back mount semi closed circuit rebreather and a back mount closed circuit rebreather. Um, I just actually tried the the, the side mount. Um, uh, which one is it? The Sidewinder from Kiss recently, which is a very streamlined unit. Um, but I think just for the simplicity of it and how kind of Neanderthal like we are with our equipment, uh, you know, nothing beats the RB80 as in terms of its durability and just reliability. Mine actually flooded on one of the last dives I did. Um, why did it flood there? I had, I had, a, I had a hole in my mouthpiece. And even though it had flooded, it worked perfectly fine. And I didn't even realize it had flooded uh, until I got back up to the surface and, and, and cleaned it out. Um, and this is just, um, you know, uh, kind of us in action. And uh, this is myself, Chris Lemayo, uh, Blake Wilson, another Ontarian, Sigurd Boetz from Norway. And this was a dive, uh, Blake and I were diving in a cenote close by here, but this is all the gear we had for, you know, one dive basically. This is from our drone looking down on one of the jungle roads. This is coming back from a dive. That wasn't just all of our tanks. That was tanks for four people here. And Mark and Allison. Allison Perkins inspired to dive. I don't know whether you've seen her photographs, but Allie's an incredible uh, photographer. So um, more than anything, what makes us successful as a group is, is teamwork and working together and, and helping each other out. And some days you're at the surface getting eaten alive by mosquitoes. Sometimes you're at the tip of the spear putting line into the cave. Sometimes you're just entering data. Uh, but everybody in our group is, we're just, happy to be doing whatever it is we happen to be doing that day and we have so much appreciation for it. Um, so teamwork is really essential. So mapping uh, the cave, right? So uh, there's a saying in cave diving that if, if you haven't created a map then you haven't been there. And so uh, that was drilled into all of us very early on. And when we started, uh, there was really one computer system for uh, mapping caves called SMAPS, which was, you know, ran on MS-DOS and was pretty uh, clunky, to say the least. So we actually, it was faster for us to hand plot the maps that we're drawing. So these are pictures from our original exploration in Oshbel Ha, kind of daily tallies right here. And this is Burn Burnback, part of Uprovesh Exploration Oshbel Ha from Germany. And Bernie's plotting out his data from a day of diving. It's kind of cool. This is Bill Phillips and, and Sabine Schnichter plotting out data. And then, as you can see here, uh, this would be from the early 2000s. I don't know what model MacBook that is. I actually have it in my office. And if I look at it, it's, it just crumbles. <laughs> it's in pretty bad shape. Uh, but what we could do here, kind of in a, a kind of a cheapened version of geographic information system is we could take the data plot that we plotted into the computer and then print it out on the printer here on acetate and then overlay it on top of an aerial photograph at the same scale and we could see more or less with some degree of accuracy actually uh, where the cave was in relationship to any surface features. We use that to help us find some cenotes. <clears throat> um, what we've transitioned to, and, and basically over the years we've done knotted line survey and that was just how you did it and there wasn't any other option to doing it. You could do a tape measure, but that takes a lot of time. So you, you kind of, with enough practice and rhythm, you, you, you get it going with the knotted line survey. 
Uh, but over the last number of years, uh, this gentleman right here, Sebastian Kister, who lives here in Plato Carmen, he's uh, French from Alsace, and uh, a, just, he's a cave diver and just a brilliant uh, computer uh, technician. And what he's done is he, he's developed two things. One is a, a piece of software called uh, Ariane uh, that we use. And the other thing that he's developed is, is something here that you can see in these photographs, which is called the Nemo. And this has just absolutely changed how we do things. And we were, I'm, I'm always very skeptical of any type of new technology. Uh, and so we just started playing around with it. And lo and behold, it was just so much more accurate than anything we've used before. And kind of in a simple breakdown, uh, in this part right here, there's a digital compass, uh, a pressure sensor, so you have azimuth and depth, and then this lever pulls back and captures the, the guideline that we have, and then you run the guideline through uh, this wheel that spins around as a result of being captured, and uh, basically there are two light sensors that point down, and there's colored discs on the, the wheel that spins around. And every time uh, it goes black, white, black, white, black, white, it's, it's counting how many times that happens. It's a fixed distance and you get distance. Um, and so it's like unbelievable. We can, we can do so much more accurately and more quickly uh, the job of survey, thanks to Sebastian and his incredible inventions here. Um, so this is Ariane here, and what you can see here is I've taken uh, the drone imagery that we have, and in Ariane's line or in geographic information system, I can superimpose uh, the cave, as we kind of did at the beginning of the presentation, on top of what the surface looks like here, which is very helpful. And so what we've started doing with Oshbelha, which would have seemed like a, the most ludicrous mad task ever is we've started resurveying uh, the entire cave uh, about a year and a half ago and last year we did a combination of about a hundred thousand meters of uh, resurvey and new exploration it's about it, it's still eh, for about every one and a half meters that we resurvey there's one meter of new exploration so this goes to kind of drive home two points. Number one is that we can do this. I never would have dreamt of resurveying it, but it, it actually seems quite doable now. There's over, we estimate, nobody knows for sure, but somewhere in the neighborhood of 300,000 meters of, of surveyed passageway or explored passageway in Oshville High. So what the NEMO is allowing us to do is revisit sections of the cave that we haven't been to in some cases uh, where we just were last week. We don't think anybody's been in there since 2002, three, I think. Um, and we're seeing it with better lights, faster scooters, semi-closed circuit rebreathers. We just have this whole new view and we have uh, 25 years of experience as well on top of it all that, that really is making us much much better at what we do. Um, so all of this is to say that, that, that Sebastian has really revolutionized how we collect data and how we visualize data. You can see here we can see depths. Any of the software that we previously used usually was a dry cave uh, survey program that could be kind of adapted to cave diving and Sebastian's is cave diving we use for both dry and wet caves uh, but it works very very well in wet cave and we just um, I don't know well I can this is just kind of we're zooming out this is the the town of Tulum right here and this is more or less the entire Oshbel hot cave system here although not uh, as updated as it is now but just to give you an idea, we've been working in this area here uh, over the last year. And one of the measures of, of good survey is what we call loop closure. And it's if, if, you, if you survey a circle, a loop, uh, the, the, the amount of error 
coming back to the point where you started is a measure. And, and generally, we're we're shooting for, you know, two three percent with hand survey. Uh, we just did a five thousand meter loop in here, and it was 075 percent uh, loop closure uh, coming back around on that huge loop, uh, proving again that the the Nemo is just an incredible tool. So many people, my mother included, uh, ask, why do you do this, right? What's the purpose of all of this stuff? And, and there's many purposes, uh, I would say. Um, for me, really the most critical focus that we have is on water in general and freshwater specifically, and even more specifically, groundwater. So this is just, you know, a, a worldwide distribution of water. I think everybody is fairly familiar with this, that, you know, 97% oceans, 3% freshwater. But when we start to break that 3% of freshwater down, uh, you realize that 77% is mostly north of you, uh, locked up in glaciers for the time being. Uh, and everything else is, you know, is uh, rivers, atmosphere, and uh, lakes, and groundwater. And of those four, 22% uh, uh, is, is groundwater. And so 20% of the world's human population depends on groundwater as their principal uh, source of, of, of potable water. And here specifically, uh, that's the case in the Yucatan Peninsula. So it's pretty sobering when you think that the total amount of water available for human consumption is actually uh, slightly greater than half of 1%. Uh, it's, it's pretty, uh, there, there's just a teeny amount of water uh, for the enormous ballooning population of humans at the surface. Uh, so we like to focus on, you know, getting people's attention. And the fact that 1.1 uh, billion people on the planet live without access to good clean drinking water. 2.6 billion people uh, live without access to, to good sanitation. 90% of the sewage in the developing world is left untreated. 70% of industrial waste in the industrial world is left untreated. 80% uh, of the diseases in the developing world are mostly waterborne. And as a result, more or less 5 million people a year die from those diseases. So uh, healthy water, clean water, extremely uh, important. Uh, good quality water and poverty uh, don't, you know, you, in order not to be poor, you need good water. So having good water is critical for uh, development in developing world. In our own particular area, the state that we live in, you can see this is population growth, growth from two, 1910, when I don't, I don't think hardly anybody, you know, pirates hung out here uh, and like bandits, uh, but there was really nothing much going on here until you can see we get to the 1970s. And of course, this is when Cancun begins to get developed and the tourism industry just starts to skyrocket as Cancun continues to expand. And then the Riviera Maya, where I live, starts to expand and, and Cozumel. Uh, I think we get about 14 million, uh, normally we get 14 million people a year uh, visiting us uh, with good reason. We have a beautiful place to come and visit. Uh, and tourism has, has taken advantage of that. Um, so we're going back to, th this is where I live in Playa del Carmen and using the Landsat imagery just to kind of show you change over time. This is Playa del Carmen in 1984. When I moved here 10 years later in 1994, there was a population of maybe 10,000 people. Uh, today it's well over 250,000 people. Uh, when I moved here, there was a one little grocery store right here uh, that wasn't very well stocked. And uh, today we have Sam's Club, Walmarts, Starbucks, Burger Kings, McDonald's, you know, the modern world has, has caught up with this area. So 1984, and I'm just going to flip through some images here, uh, and you can see, uh, 
just the transfer. Oops, that's weird. There's one missing. Huh. Anyway, uh, the transformation that only goes to 2000. So there's there's actually more uh, that's happened subsequently. The, the development of Playa has now pretty much everything that's green here has now been developed, um, and it's kind of sad to have kind of, you know, bear witness to all of that. Uh, but it's happening all over the place. Uh, another way the maps can help us here is by uh, kind of showing you a, a, a case study here where you have uh, this road right here. This is an aerial photograph. Uh, the red squiggly lines are the Sakak Toon Cave system. If you're familiar with Grand Cenote, it's right here. Uh, Car wash cenote is right here. Um, and so all the red squiggly lines are cave. The blue arrows are indicating flow of water through the cave. And I kind of haven't mentioned that, but the, these cave systems are conduits for uh, transport of fresh water moving from the inland out to the ocean. And we have infiltration of salt water down below uh, moving uh, potentially hypothetically across the peninsula. Um, so what's scary about this image here is the basurero, that means dump in Spanish, and this was the municipal dump for, for uh, the town of Tulum uh, for a number of years. It's subsequently been shut down, uh, but it's actually upstream of the water flow of the municipal well zone, which are these uh, six pump stations right here. So they're pumping water out of the ground here, and then it gets transported as the municipal water supply down to Tulum to the south. And of course, the garbage dump is right on top of it. <clears throat> uh, in fact, one of these pumps had to be shut down. The levels of contamination were so high. So uh, Maps help us kind of explain uh, what's going on. So I, like, I, I probably have gone on too long, but it's, it's like, I can't impart to you all enough just how much the adventure continues to go on here. We just have endless opportunities. And it's, it's I think all of us that are involved, I know I speak for Fred and Chris and myself, uh, we're just so, uh, feel so fortunate and privileged to have the experiences that we have down here, uh, not only to contribute uh, to a greater understanding of a wide variety of scientific disciplines, uh, but just the kind of sheer sense of adventure that, that we have uh, going out and through the jungle and then down beneath the jungle and now above the jungle with the drone uh, to explore it all. Um, and I thought I'd, I'd, I'd close out with this. So in, um, uh, when was it? Uh, a few years ago, up until, when was it, 2018, uh, Fred's brother is, brother-in-law is a, a conservation biologist in, in um, uh, Australia at the University of New England in New South Wales. And he actually came here and did a study over two years putting camera traps into cenotes to kind of, we were just curious what was coming in and out of cenotes. And so I'll let this play, but this is um, what was captured on, on one of the cameras. We have, uh, in fact, lots of images like this. Uh, but as you can see here on the left side of the screen, it's a, a, a nice jaguar. Uh, waking up from a nap in Lotus Sonote. And uh, it's a very photogenic jaguar. Uh, I don't know whether it's a male or a female, but it's, it's going to come right up to the, the camera here and give us a nice smile. Um, and I like to close with this because, uh, you know, this is the, the, the kings and queens of the jungle here are, the, this is the kind of the apex predator for this region. And, uh, they depend on the cenotes uh, just as much as we do. And uh, while it's very cool, it's actually kind of scary because you, you realize we have to go down there and collect these cameras, uh, not knowing until we get back and unload it that the Jaguar has just been there. Um, but um, anyway, it, it's just to kind of drive home the point that the, the cenotes are extremely important and uh, these beautiful places of magic and beauty. Um, 
So, uh, of course, we have lots of help uh, from a number of McMaster University in, in, in Ontario. Uh, we, th there's all kinds of things that I really haven't had time to talk about tonight, but as I mentioned at the beginning, I'd be more than happy to, to talk about. Uh, we're doing a lot of photogrammetry. Uh, we're starting to incorporate a lot of geographic information systems online to kind of help consolidate all of the, the spatial data that we have for this area. Um, we're doing filming with 360 cameras. Uh, if you go on to our, uh, actually, uh, this is thanks. We receive a lot of support both from uh, uh, private donors and organizations and uh, uh, companies to, to be able to do what we're doing. And we're, of course, very grateful to their support. Um, and what I wanted to say is that if you go on our Instagram page, again, this is like where you're going to have the best access to what we have. But on our YouTube channel, uh, you'll see several of the 360 videos. We got to play with something called a Boxfish camera latch ear, which is very high resolution, shoots in 6K uh, 360 camera. And it's just an incredible way uh, to take people uh, into this area. Most people, I think, are sensible enough not to want to cave dive. Uh, but they, you know, I had both my, my parents diving uh, with me last year with VR goggles on and looking at the 360 images. And it was just uh, it's a pretty moving experience, uh, literally and figuratively. So, um, Greg, that's kind of where I am. And, you know, I'm, I'm more than happy to, if there's any questions that you guys might have, I'm very happy to answer them. Uh, Greg, I don't know, you're back. Let me turn up my volume. I hope, I, I hope everybody was able to hear that. And yeah, that, I think it was very good. I don't think we had anybody chat that they had problems and okay. uh, incredible, Sam. It just shows you how passionate divers are. Like, you know, whether you're, you know, taking photos, you know, in BC, or you get into technical diving or wreck diving or cave diving in Mexico, we all have that same, like, just growing passion. And it's really, it's so cool to see that last, you know, for so many years for you, Sam. So, yeah, I mean, it just wow. never stops. And, yeah. and like I said, it's, it's stoke. It's, it's like, I, you know, it doesn't matter to me what level a diver is at. It's just that they're willing to, my, my tombstone as I'm Sure, you've seen on many dive stars will say 75% of the planet is underwater. Why yeah. are you? Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, uh, that's definitely my attitude. I think everybody should have, you know, if everybody was diving, well, there probably wouldn't be any reefs left. But, yeah. <laughs> uh, but you know, I think it would open people's eyes up to this just unbelievable place that we have. And there's still, you know, this is just the Yucatan Peninsula. There's places, there's shipwrecks, there's all kinds of environments. There's caves all over the world. Uh, so um, I'm, I'm grateful to have the opportunity. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you, Sam. So um, if you, whoever has a question, we're happy to put you... Um, uh, unmute you and let you ask Sam directly. So I'm just going to look at who's got questions. And then if you don't want to ask it directly and you want me to ask it, then quickly put that down because otherwise I'm going to put you on the spot here. So let's see. I just Do I, it. Do I have to answer in the form of a question? <laughs> yes. Okay. So uh, it looks like Sarah has a couple questions here. So I am going sure. to find her. Sarah, where's Sarah? I don't know. I, this is now we're getting into un, unknown territory. <laughs> now the technology is It's alphabetical. Out. Isn't that cool? All right. Okay. Did I let Sarah talk? Are you able to talk, Sarah? No, we're going to try one more time. Um, no, I think I lost Sarah. Let me see if I can ask. Uh, Sarah, can you use your hand signals? Yeah. There we are. There, Sarah. I made it happen. Good job. All right. Um, oh, Mike, can you see me? No. I, I can't okay. see you, but I can yeah, hear you for sure. Okay. Uh, my question is, free diving can only take you so far. Eventually, you'll have to scuba. 
uh, based on how you said you like to explore. So what is the factor that makes you want to bring back your equipment uh, to the places um, that you initially explored free diving? Uh -huh. Take you to the places that free diving couldn't. Yeah, so I mean, free diving, like you said, only takes us so far, but it gives us kind of a, a, a glance at what's down there. And of course, what we're looking for is a massive tunnel heading off into the distance. And there's other things we can kind of gauge, uh, which is flow. And sometimes the most unassuming cenote, um, the one we've been diving out of the, the last week, it's literally a mud hole in the middle of the jungle. You would, you would walk by it and not even think about getting into it. But in <laughs> fact, uh, and you wouldn't really want to free dive in it because it's completely tannic water. Uh, so you don't have very good visibility. Uh, but uh, yeah, free diving is just kind of the first step. And before we commit to lugging a whole bunch of equipment out, uh, we want to be very certain that at least there's some uh, good reason to be diving in there. So that's what free diving helps us do. And it's just, it's nice. You can kind of check a number of different cenotes in this kind of a, a similar area and uh, then come back and, and kind of systematically work to knock them off. So, you do, uh, so you're looking for long tunnels basically that lead to an ominous dark place. Well, I wouldn't say ominous. <laughs> I mean, definitely a dark place. Ominous is, is in the eyes of the beholder, I guess. But to me, they're fantastic places. But yeah, I mean, this is, yeah, we're just, you know, I guess it's it, it, the experience we have over the years. We kind of have an idea of kind of things to look for and, and to read that will give us some degree of certainty that it's worth doing it. And even still, sometimes half the fun is getting out. It's not the goal that's finding the gold. It's, 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 it's uh, just the, the kind of camaraderie that we have as we get eaten alive by mosquitoes, getting dressed to go diving um, out there. Did that answer your question, Sarah? Uh, yes, it did. Thank you. No, thank you. All right. MC? Hey, All right. Hey, what did you call me? The MC. MC oh. Greg. Oh, okay. That was a nickname of mine, I just wasn't sure if you were referring to that. Um, so yeah, and then of course uh, I put Sarah on the spot and then she asked me to ask the question. So sorry, Sarah. Um, so uh, somebody else was asking um, how often you're diving. So how, how many day, day, uh, days a week do you dive, Sam? Well, during coronavirus, uh, we've been we've just trying been trying to be responsible citizens, and we all have families and children, and we we've been staying pretty low profile. Uh, but uh, it kind of depends. But I'm trying to dive at least three days a week, and um, but this week I've been fighting a massive infection. So I, I was supposed to be diving all this week, uh, Monday through Wednesday, and it just didn't happen. So life gets in the way as well. But I, you know, uh, I'd have to look at my logbook. But I don't. I think we do. I don't know. Uh, you know, some. It, it's it's more the duration of the dive. It's the hours we spend underwater. I mean, I think our average dives are probably like four to five hours, with maximum being maybe seven. Um, so you can't really do that on a, or at least I can't really do that on a repetitive basis as I get older. I kind of just, you know, I have lots of, uh, things called knees <laughs> in the back that I'm trying to protect. Uh, so, um, it, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's how I, what I would say. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so speaking of ominous, mm. we have an anonymous attendee that's asking a question. <laughs> yeah, play on words. Um, what kind of software do you use to map the caves? Is there anything that you wish you had but didn't or don't? Oh, that's a great question. So we use Arian, which is if you, if you do a Google search for A-R-I-N-E, uh, or Nemo, M-N-E-M-O, uh, you'll find uh, the uh, 
Sebastian's website, I think it's ariansline.com, <laughs> but that's the software we use, and it's super simple to use. And the best thing about it is that the Nemo, the device that he developed for Cape Survey, uh, there's a USB port on it. So I just, at the end of the dive, we can unscrew the screw, plug in the USB cable, plug it directly into a computer, and boom, it sucks all the information out. So what used to be a very tedious process, prone to lots of error of transcribing handwritten notes that sometimes, you know, people don't always have great handwriting or things get smudged and you're kind of guessing what the data is, uh, this just makes that process so much faster. And it's, it's great because you pretty much instantaneously see the results of that day's of diving, whereas it would have taken overnight in some cases for a lot of data to get processed. So Arian is the, the survey uh, software that we use and it's, it's worked very well for us. Awesome. We're pushing it to its limit with, with the Oshbell Hot Cave system, yeah, which that. is good. Yeah. I'm always emailing. Sebastian's amazing too. He's very responsive. Divers are just all a bunch of real nerds, aren't they? <laughs> Count me in. Yeah. Hey, um, so before I ask another question, I'm just going to pass this on from Deirdre. She says, thank you very much. Uh, it's remarkable and would love to have you come back and tell us more. So she's looking for an encore presentation. And yes. I think written in there somewhere in between the words is that you guys have to come and visit us very soon. Okay, well, yeah. uh, let's let's get through our current yeah. situation here. So, um, yeah. so uh, what uh, what's the common depth that you're diving to in the cenotes? Ah, yeah, no, that's good. Um, so, I'd say the average depth fifteen meters. Um, the the deepest cenote on the peninsula is, geez, it's it's like over five hundred feet deep. I don't know how many meters that is, uh, but the deepest cave system we have, that's more inland. It's a sinkhole, uh, Sabaka, Sanote Sabaka, mm. and no one's gotten to the bottom of it. It's, they've just kind of gotten to 500 feet and then they couldn't go any further. Is that the pit or is that different? Say again? Is that the same one as the pit? No, so the pit, is, that's in Sistema dos Ojos, which is just down the road mm. here, and that's... Uh, uh, 119 meters. It's, it's oh, okay. It's Still pretty shy, deep. 400 feet deep. But there's no cave passageway there. That's what makes it interesting. Mm. And there's kind of it's like Oyo Negro. There's the pit, the blue abyss, and and um, uh, Oyo Negro all in very close proximity to one another. Uh, I don't know whether anybody really knows why, uh, but there are these anomalous, for the most part, uh, just <laughs> shafts. Uh, that go down to a much deeper level, which is cool. It's like, it's totally three-dimensional here. In the area that we're working right now, we have a, a pretty good layer at about 14, 15 meters. Then we go down to 20, like 18, 20 meters. And then we have another layer that drops down as deep as 30 meters. So it's multi-level uh passageways what makes it you know very challenging and interesting there's there's kind of cave on top of the cave um which is fun awesome um what's another one here somebody wanted to know if you found your knife that you dropped 25 years yes, ago yes i did it was a gift from my wife so i just like yeah. if i hadn't found yeah, it i would have been <laughs> deep um, uh i don't know this cenote uh, zapote zapote uh-huh yep yep how deep is that one? That one, if I'm not mistaken, is somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 meters deep. Yeah. Super cool. So not they? Five zero meters. Five zero. Yes. Yeah. yeah. They they pulled it. The they, Hell's Bells or Sonote Sapote. There are these incredible formations in there uh, that I believe are biological. They're not like liquid rock. And there's also a, a species of sloth that they were able to, a giant ground sloth that they, they found at the bottom of it as well. Mm. Uh, what about, how do they manage the tourism at the cenotes and the impact that they might have? Well, uh, that's a great question. Uh, it's dependent on from landowner to landowner. And I have to be honest in saying that I really, actually cenote zapote, uh, I, I know Fatima, the owner is a very nice woman and She's done actually a pretty nice job of developing the cenote there. But for the most part, you know, cenotes, I, there's, 
uh, a book of best practices that was uh, put together by a bunch of uh, non-governmental organizations here on you know what you should do and what you shouldn't do to a cenote. And unfortunately, cenotes just get decimated by uh, even before tourists arrive. And that's kind of the burden of being kind of sometimes the first people to see some of these sites is you have the memory of what it once looked like. And um, then to go back years later and you see there's a road to it now and, and there's 500 people swimming in it, it's pretty disheartening. Um, but yeah, there, there are no real official government rules. Uh, there's kind of guidelines that people have thrown out there. Uh, one of my dreams would be to purchase a cenote and create a model site, you know, with uh, carrying capacity and also, uh, you know, make the, the right infrastructure on top of it with uh, the proper types of uh, composting toilets and rainwater capture and uh, promoting planting of, of uh, local native plants, uh, et cetera. I think you could do such a great job and it totally surprised me that nobody has here at least to my liking. Nice. Um, so here's a good question. So uh, mm -hmm. if somebody wants to start to learn to dive cenote, so I imagine what they're um, mm -hmm. looking for is become a cave diver in Mexico or get mm -hmm. trained in Mexico. Um, mm -hmm. If they were to start their process here in BC, what would you suggest they do? So become technical divers, would they become side mount divers? Uh, you know, what types well, of training would help? Yeah, I mean, I think, and I know Greg does a terrific job of this, but it, it's it's all down to fundamental skills. And I, I'm a GUE instructor, and so I come kind of from the background of, of global underwater explorers, and I kind of fell into that, and, and uh, there's a progression of training. And I think more and more organizations are starting to get into that. And I think it's you really, before you move, you know, there, there's kind of a tendency in the dive industry to just kind of blast people through from zero to hero, they say, uh, and get people at the end of a line cave diving with 50 dives, you know. And uh, I think you really have to commit to um, really getting the fundamental skills down. And so buoyancy control, trim, stability, propulsion techniques, uh, that's critical. And once you have that, then it unlocks a whole other level of what we teach, which is situational awareness, muscle memory. Uh, those things as well uh, are just absolutely critical. Uh, so, you know, I, I would say the fundamental skills, so many sports, I mean, if you think about uh, soccer, baseball, American, any sport, there are fundamental skills that you have to learn to be good to do it. And this is where, I mean, start with this guy right here, Greg, in a pool and learn how to properly do, uh, you know, stay trim and stable, uh, good buoyancy control, your head up, being looking around, right? Uh, having your head up is one of the things that I'm just constantly repeating to my fundamental students is you've got, if you start looking down, everything else drops out of control. So keeping your head up as well. So, you know, uh, I think you're, you're in great hands with Greg uh, to begin to develop those fundamental skills. And if you have, then it's time to progress, you know, kind of slowly bite off little things. And I'd say, you know, before you invest heavily in a cave diving class, uh, if you have the ability to come down here and do a cenote tour, do you know every single dive shop here takes people on uh, a sanctioned guided tour of the peripheries of the entrances of the cenote. So you're always in the daylight zone, and there's some absolutely gorgeous places to go, and just try it out and see if it really is something you like before you invest in all the equipment and time and energy and, and training, um, and see if you like it, and then you know, what, if, if you do like it, then by all means, you know, uh, continue the progression of training. All right, good answer. Like the trim part and stuff. Um, hey, so uh, one of the things that I say just along those lines too is that when you get those found, fundamental skills, or we call them foundational skills, but uh, that when you get to wherever you want to go, you can just ladder into it 
rather than let's say you dive for five or six or 10 years or whatever, and then you say, hey, I wanna get into this type of diving. And then somebody looks at you and says, well, we need to teach you all these new things already. Whereas you've already yeah. mastered those things. So then you can say, well, now I just have to learn the new skills. I've already got the foundation or the fundamentals of the, the proper base skills. So it's good. Yeah. Yeah. Confident. <clears throat> yeah. Confident, comfortable, and capable. That's yeah. what I hope my students will be. And, and, and the, the concept of situational awareness is so absolutely critical and knowing where your team is and uh, being, you know, checking your, your equipment, the environment, your team, uh, yourself, uh, having that awareness is just absolutely critical. And once you have all the skills dialed in, it just becomes much easier to deal with. Yeah, And I, I have to say, one of the things, you know, GUE gets uh, grief about a standardized equipment configuration, but what I love about it uh, is the fact that of all of the equipment configurations I showed you tonight with our back mount gear, our side mount gear, closed circuit rebreather gear, semi-closed circuit back mount, and side mount uh, semi-closed circuit, uh, it's all the same configuration, uh, more or less. Obviously, with the rebreathers, we have the breathing loop, and there's other components involved. Uh, but I don't have to readjust, or I can take a back plate off of my doubles, and I can put it on one of the rebreathers. And it's like nothing has changed at all. And so I think that, uh, I personally think it's a fantastic thing, standardization of equipment just across uh, your own gear, but also within the team, uh, promotes much more safety, I think, and much more familiarity with, with gear. Uh, so, I, you know, I'm, I'm yeah. kind of we agree with that. we had on there, but I, I think standardization. Yeah, that's a, it's a, obviously, it's a great concept because, yeah, like if yeah. I know what your gear looks like because it's the same as my gear, then it's a lot easier for me to resource yeah. tools that you might have that I might need or, or help you if you need it or vice versa. So it's good. Absolutely. And, and if something breaks and you've got to use someone else's gear, it's exactly you know, it's the where same. It is. It's yeah. not like different. Yeah. So yeah, it doesn't that, cause anxiety or stress. Are you, when you do side mount, are you doing it still independent doubles then or are you using uh, some type of manifold? Well, we have in, 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 uh, single, uh, we use uh, steel 85s here. Yeah. We just we get better capacity for gas, and, and um, they trim out very well. Christoph developed the Halcyon Zero Gravity Wing, mm -hmm. uh, or harness that we use, yeah. and uh, it's very nice. It works very well. It's very, very streamlined. Yeah, I've seen it. It's good. Hey, so uh, is there a particular cenote that's your favorite, or, or cave? Ah, uh, that's, that's tough. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, that is a question I get a lot. And what I always say is it's, it's not so much the place, but it's the experience you have with someone else. And uh, I think, you know, it's just uh, the things I've seen and the, the, the experiences I've had uh, with some of my best friends. And of course, diving at this level, you develop friendships with people because there's just such a high level of trust and respect uh, of each other and our skill sets and, and what we do. And uh, so for me, it's, it's kind of, it's not necessary. It, it's like the whole day of diving from when I wake up and I'm excited. I'm 53 years old and I'm still like a little kid going out the door to go diving in the morning. And, you know, in, in all the dives that Chris and I were doing last week, you know, we're chatting on the way down, we're chatting on the way back and we're debriefing and we're going over the dive in our mind. Uh, but we're just so thrilled to have that opportunity. So, I, I mean, it's really hard for me to say. I think every, you know, any time I spend in the water is beautiful. Uh, and I think I kind of have to compartmentalize, you know, different types of experiences that I've had. But uh, it, it's very hard for me to pick one specific place that's more beautiful than the other because I know there's another place out there that I haven't seen yet that uh, maybe next week I will uh, that's astoundingly beautiful. Awesome. All right. So I'm going to ask one more question unless anybody has a real burning question here and then we'll wrap it up. So um, one of the things that you were talking about is going back and resurvey surveying um, systems mm. that you'd already surveyed and you're now using the new technology like the, the Nemo device. Mm. So yeah. how close 
um, comparing your old method of surveying to what you're mm. getting now, how close are the end results? So, I mean, what you're saying is a comparison of our old survey techniques with the new one? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, actually, our old survey is actually really good. And so, it, it's kind of a validation of what we were able to accomplish. And much of the original, we started, our first dive in Cenote Esmeralda was 1997. And then we really started kind of focusing on it in 1998, 99, and forward. And uh, so all of that was hand survey. Uh, and most of that was done solo diving in sidebound gear. And, you know, it's like with teeny little lights. And uh, it's actually amazing how accurate the original survey is. However, you know, every once in a while, there's an azimuth that's way off or it's reversed, and that can kind of throw everything out of whack. And so what we've been able to do by resurveying is, is shore up the data that we have, uh, the old data, which is good, but there's errors in it, um, and just make it a little bit better. Well, thanks so much, Sam, for, for doing this for us. We really, really appreciate it. Oh, I mean, it went back. Yeah. Um, fantastic. Like the experiences that you have um, in diving are just there. I mean, I, I think even after this presentation, it just opens up just the smallest amount of what you experience that you've got and the accomplishments that you've made and so forth. And I think it's just amazing um, to see how enthusiastic you are and um, just fantastic. So thanks so much. And it we're all started in Victoria, British Columbia. Yeah, for sure. I remember those days very well. And like wow, you, it was so much fun. You know, the, the, like I remember the experiences you and I had diving so oh, much, yeah. more than even the sites to some degree. And I know we've got. Yeah, just, I think the most important thing for anybody is to have fun. And, yeah. and we have fun even when we're way we're 3000 meters back into a cave we're still like pushing and shoving each other and you know giving each other grief and mm -hmm. uh we have fun and yeah. it, the, the day it's not fun anymore is the day i stop but i don't yeah. see that coming anytime soon yeah definitely agree all yeah. right okay well gregory thank you sir thank you sam so thanks very much thanks yeah. again everybody for joining us and uh everybody stay safe and well and we'll Yes, right. yes, please stay safe and thank you for taking the time out to listen to me ramble on. All right. All right, guys. Goodbye is a hard Sam. I'm gonna uh, I'll I'll check in with you at some point. <laughs> Thanks guys. I appreciate it. Bye bye.